Uh, today's guest is a uh, comic book legend, Mr. Tony Isabella. Uh, hopefully that's okay with calling you a comic book legend. Your work has you know, spawned many decades. So I, pre I, I prefer living legend. <laughs> Living legend it is. Living legend, Tony yes. Isabella. Tony, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. You're very welcome. Um, Tony, I, I guess my first question, and uh, as my first comic book author, writer on the series, I want to ask this question a little bit different than I ask all my other guests. Do you consider yourself a geek? Um. I've never particularly liked the word geek. I don't mind it. Uh, but I've been reading comics since before I was four years old. So, so I think I'm kind of grandfathered in as something, you know, beyond being a geek. So what would you consider yourself as when it comes to comics and comic books? I'm a comics fan, a comics writer, uh a comics advocate especially for creators uh because i do work in an industry that is not creator friendly um and i quite proudly carry the tag social justice warrior because why would you not want to fight for social justice which is a good uh, a good jumping off point and you've just mentioned so much things i want to dive into but um, a little bit backstory about yourself. You said you got into comics at the age of four. That I learned to read from comics before I was four years old. Um, relatives would read comics to me. I would pay very close attention to the words on the page as they read them because I wanted to, you know, cut out the middleman. Uh, and amusingly, uh, my mother didn't realize that I could read on my own until another relative told her, you know, Tony can read these things on his own. Do you remember what comics you were reading at four years old? It's a vague memory. Superman uh, was obviously among them. I mean, every kid was reading Superman. Casper rings a bell. Uh, I don't know exactly where they fell into the mix, uh, but presto kid which was a magician cowboy who appeared in he took over the red mask comic book and he didn't have a gun he just had magic tricks and he'd only have one story in the issue but he was the cover feature and that was drawn by my dear friend dick Ayers. looking back and i know it seems like a such a young age did you become enthralled with comics at that age and say you know what this could potentially, I know you're only four at the time, but this is something I want to continue on for my entire life is to learn and to see what other people are doing in comics or was it sort of just a passing fad at that time for yourself? Um, at that time, everybody hoped it would be a passing <laughs> fad, but I used to take toy soldiers, you know, the, the green plastic marks uh, toy soldiers and act out my own superhero stories with them. Uh, I always felt embarrassed for the, the one soldier who had to be Wonder Woman, but, you know, those, those were those were not as as woke times for me. Uh, no, I, I always I love telling stories. I love the way comics told stories. Uh, I started looking at it as a possible career in 1963. Um, I read I was on a very boring family vacation. And. Uh, I would buy comics at every stop along the way because then you could, because they were all over the place. My parents were getting very upset with me spending my souvenir money on comic books. And I said, well, it's my souvenir money. And when we got to a little town called Oneonta, New York, where my dad had relatives, I was told that I could only buy one more comic because this particular relative had a cigar and magazine store. So I went immediately to the comics. I was told one more comic and that's it. I was going to show them. I was going to buy a quarter comic. But I had all the DC quarter comics. I wasn't interested in the Archie quarter comics at that time. So I bought Fantastic Four annual number one. This despite the fact that the only other issue of Fantastic Four I had read, Kurgo 
Master of Planet X or something like that, I didn't like. I couldn't understand these heroes fighting among each other, being treated as outcasts. It was so different from the DC stuff. But I picked up Fantastic Four Annual Number One with like this 37 page story Submariner Conquers the Human Race. Uh, it had all these backup features and fact pages. And I just got hooked. I must have read that comic a dozen times on that trip. And somewhere along the line, I realized people get paid to make these things. I want that job. And pretty much from then on, I, I tried to train myself to write comics. I got involved in comics fandom. I would correspond with writers and editors. Uh, I was training myself. I wrote comic stories for old fanzines that no longer exist and have probably faded by this point because they were printed on Ditto Masters. Uh, but yeah, I trained myself from, from about the age of, of 12, 13. I knew that, that I wanted to uh, write comic books. So now my take, backup oh. plan was to become Clark Kent. <laughs> okay. And I actually worked for the Cleveland Plain Dealer for a while, which was a, an incredibly shitty newspaper. It was a tool of the rich and the powerful. Uh, and I just didn't enjoy working there much. So when I got a job at Marvel, uh, I quit the Plain Dealer. And I actually, I owe the Plain Dealer my job at Marvel because we went on strike. We were picketing the building. The publisher called up his good buddy, the mayor, and we were attacked by mounted policemen. I was knocked to the ground by a fleeing copy editor and a horse's hoof landed inches from my face. I dusted myself off, went home, called Roy Thomas, who was a friend of mine and who I had corresponded with and said, is there any kind of work at Marvel that I could get? And he said, well, yeah, Stanley needs somebody to help them with the British weeklies we're launching and some other stuff. So yeah, I mean, it was, you know, being, being almost run over by a horse that got me to Marvel Comics. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, um, what is the process of writing a comic for yourself? Because you said you, you started after reading that first Fantastic Four annual number one, you started writing for yourself and you started writing uh, uh, comics for yourself. So what was the process? Because I think most people don't understand the process of getting uh, piece and a piece of paper and pen and starting to write the story because that's always the hardest part. So for you, what was the process when you were first starting out? Well, I started writing and drawing comics tracing a lot of figures uh, and, and convincing myself that I was not a very good artist. So I found friends who could draw at least better than I could. So I would write scripts for them. Uh, and I started out writing them. There's a, a book by Stan Lee called Secrets Behind the Comics that has, shows this really awkward script format of, of the descriptions on one side of the page and the dialogue and captions on the other. And all of my early scripts for these other artists were written that way until I finally figured out this is a stupid way to write comics. So my scripts these days, because I prefer to do full scripts, are, you know, panel description, the copy that goes in the panel. I break down these stories page by page, panel by panel. Um, usually, sometimes I just start on page one and go right through. Sometimes I actually break it down on index comic on index cards, but yeah, that's my process. Um, finding the time to write the comics and writing them well are the hardest parts of the job. Ideas come to me daily. I have a bucket list of, of literally several hundred things I want to write that I'll probably never get to before I die. I'm, I'm thinking of writing them up as uh, like one page uh, pitches. And then when I die, I have my family auction them off to other writers. Perfect way to make some money for the estate, if you ask me. <laughs> um, so we'll go into your time in Marvel. So you almost get trampled by a horse here. In, right. <laughs> and then you literally become part of one of the most budding comic book, uh, uh, I would say, creations in all of the world 
in a short period of time, like literally transition is short for you. How was it your first few years, at, or first year at Marvel? Well, I, I was only in the Marvel offices about three years before I went freelance. But, you know, I was treated, you know, I was, you know, when I first, the first day I showed up for work, Don McGregor came out of his office to welcome me to Marvel. Uh, I learned so much from Stan Lee, Sal Brodsky, Roy Thomas. I didn't even, I, I worked in a large office with Sal Brodsky, Pablo Marcus, wow. George Russo, and a few other people. I didn't actually have a desk. I had a tabaret that they put a typewriter on. Uh, when I became a, a full editor at Marvel, editing some of the black and white magazines and other magazines, I actually got an office with a desk. But you know, I was right there. I could see how things were being done. Everybody was, was so kind to me. Uh, I had my, what I call my Italian uncles in Mike Esposito and Frank Giacoya, who had great stories. Uh, there was Vinnie Coletta, who was kind of the, you know, a little bit shady uncle that maybe the family didn't talk about that much. Uh, but he was always great to me. I met Larry Lieber, who's one of the sweetest human wow. beings on the face of the earth. I still keep in touch with Larry. And when I get to New York, I always make sure we go out to dinner together. Uh, Jim Salakrup, who was just basically an errand boy at that time. I mean, literally everybody at Marvel, you know, was great. There were a few people who were, you know, full of themselves, <laughs> as you'll find in any kind of creative endeavor. But for the most part, it was really great. Um, Going from a fan's perspective, though, going from being a fan of the comic books and into a job with the comic book series and the in industry, how was that transition for yourself? Was it what you expected or was it a lot more uh, detail oriented compared to what you were originally imagining working well, I, for a comic? You know, there, there were a lot more details involved because it wasn't just a question of, of knocking out a script for my friends to draw. Uh, I had to you know, up my game. But, you know, and I had to learn production things and, and such. But, you know, the main thing was I was always very aware that I was yet another comics fan who had just broken into comics. And I kind of regret that I felt that way because I would have had the opportunity to interview so many people and ask them so many questions about their work. And I didn't do it because I was a very young guy. I was an editor. I mean, I was essentially the editor of the of the British weeklies, which meant I was assigning covers and feature pages and, and the zip tone work we, we did because we only had like one color uh, per issue. So I, I was an editor. I had people much older than me and much more experienced working for me. So I always kind of held back my, my fanboy instincts to ask them a zillion questions, which I really regret now. Uh, because comics, the comics industry tends to make people disappear. They, you know, they really, what's keeping people alive, what keeps people in the memories of people are not the industry itself for the most part. It's the comics historians, it's the comics fan, it's the comics creator themselves, like, you know, Roy Thomas, for one, with his amazing alter ego fanzine. And uh, well, magazine, it's, you know, it's too professional to call it a fanzine. But yeah, I mean, there is so much comics history to uncover. So many comics creators that we'll never know much about. Uh, so yeah, I, I wish I had talked to more of these, you know, asked the questions, interviewed them, gotten this stuff down uh, so that I can contribute more to comics history. I try, I mean, I, I try to remember people on my Facebook page. Um, and at some point I'll write a couple of volumes of my memoirs of sorts. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my one regret that I didn't take advantage of, of knowing and working with all these amazing people. Wow. During the trans, during those three, first three years at Marvel Comics, uh, you were an editor. You were working with the British Marvel uh, uh, outlet. When did you transition into a writer, would you say? Was it during those oh. first three years? Or... Oh, yeah, almost almost immediately because the Marvel sa salaries were not good. And, I, and we were living in New York, which was, 
not as expensive as it is today, but still more expensive than Cleveland. Uh, so Marvel would give you freelance opportunities. I wrote articles for the various magazines. Uh, I wrote letter columns. And eventually I was given a chance to write some stories. Uh, I was kind of a utility player in that if the writer of Captain America was late and Roy Thomas had to plot an issue like immediately and couldn't write the whole thing himself, I'd come in and I'd script the issue. Um, and eventually, you know, I landed on regular titles like Ghost Rider uh, and stayed with them. Do you remember your first publication? Uh, my first comic stories to be published was actually a two page stupid story in a tabloid newspaper called the Monster Times. Uh, that came out in New York. Uh, I wrote articles for them. I wrote this comic strip. Uh, I would only get paid by them when I actually showed up at their offices. So they were, they were kind of a shady organization. But, but the Monster Times magazine, you know, tabloid itself was lots of fun. At Marvel, um, I think my first story was a three-pager for Chamber of Chills. Uh, it was not the best experience uh, for me because it was originally pitched as a seven-page story. I was told I had three pages. I had to do it Marvel style, which meant, you know, doing a plot and then scripting it later. The plot went to an artist who was beyond his best days. And I just froze when I saw the artwork because it was so difficult to work with. So it took me like three nights to write a three page story. Um, and I thought, oh, that's it. They'll never, you know, give me another job. But I actually, the next thing I wrote, I think, was I ghosted a Vampirella story for Len Wein. Um, and I aped Len's style as, you know, pretty well, I thought. So did Len, because he originally just wanted me to do a rough draft and he ended up using most of my final uh, script. And he and, and Marv Wolfman mentioned to Roy that, you know, Tony's really good. So I started getting more work. So thank you, Len, thank you, Marv. <laughs> Writing for established characters, like you said, Ghost Rider. Uh, you've also written for other comics uh, during your time at Marvel as well, including Spider-Man. How, how hard is it to write something for an established character like those? Um, for the most part, I look at the core values of the character. I'm, a, I'm very much a core values guy, which is, which is why I've recently, I, I scream when I see what Bla what DC did with Black Lightning after Black Lightning Cold Dead Hands, because they they violated everything that's a core value of, of Jefferson Pierce. Um, the three things he cares about more than anything else are his family, his students, and his community. He is a reluctant hero. You know, he, he does it because he has the ability and he can. After Cold Dead Hands, you know, the I don't know how to describe them without being too insulting. Let's say the clueless editors and writers who wrote Black Lightning stories after Cold Dead Hands violated every one of those things. He leaves his family. He leaves his students. He leaves his community to become support staff for Batman, the most manipulative costume character of them all um and it just has gotten worse he and katana were friends a beautiful relationship crafted by my friend mike w Barr. well again the the clueless people have decided they must be a couple uh the clueless people think that character development means making a character more powerful so they did that with Black Lightning. They had Batman experimenting on Black Lightning. And at the same time they were doing this, the Black Lightning TV show, which is brilliant, was doing a season long arc on the results of the government experimenting on black people. This is the kind of cluelessness that DC has towards Black Lightning. Um, and I guess in this latest incarnation, he's not even human anymore. He's a living lightning bolt who I think resides in a sword. I'm not sure it was pretty hard to read. Um, 
I will say that John Ridley's uh, Other History of the DC Universe, number one, brilliant, brilliant work. John did took the character some places that when I wrote these stories originally, I could not take them, take Black Lightning. But John did it brilliantly. Um, and to hear that this award-winning award -winning screenwriter was inspired to become a writer from my Black Lightning work in the 70s um, makes me wonder what else I've got. You know, it, I know what else I've got in the tank. What I wonder is why don't DC and Marvel wonder what else does Tony Isabella have in the tank? But getting back to your original question, core values. You know, I look at Captain America, I said, who's Captain America? What, what are the core values of Captain America or Spider-Man or the Hulk or any of the characters I wrote? In the case of Ghost Rider, who was not that old at the time, knowing that I couldn't do the kind of hillbilly Satanism that my friend Gary Friedrich did, uh, I knew I'd have to take it in a different direction, which is why I started a two-year storyline that was the ultimate aim of that would have been to turn Ghost Rider into more of a white hat superhero. He'd still have the supernatural powers, but he'd, he'd be, you know, a much more together guy um, with, you know, built, you know, starting to build a family, working in Hollywood, kind of like a modern take on the Simon and Kirby stuntman comic. Uh, I really like the idea of a superhero stuntman in in evil Hollywood. Um, so yeah, Marvel so, didn't like that though. Marvel wasn't oh, no. a fan of that changing the no, no. idea of Ghost Rider. No, no, no. Don't get this wrong. Okay, there was one person who didn't like the storyline that ended with basically, and in Marvel speak, I didn't come out and say it. Johnny Blazes accepts Jesus as his savior and Satan has no more power over him. I did it in Marvel speak. I, I did not make it obvious. And at that point, had I continued on the book, um, there wouldn't have been, Satan would have been out of the book. The Jesus character that I brought in under the name, the friend would have been out of the book. Johnny Blaze would have, have crossed a threshold and been able to, you know, get on with his life and lead a better life. Uh, there was one assistant editor at Marvel who strenuously objected to this, denies it to this, well, denies it about half the time these days because he just never keeps his story straight um, and had it changed, pulled it back from John for Porton's office to rewrite and have slightly redrawn about three pages and ended up making the Jesus character a demon in disguise, which makes absolutely no freaking sense if you've been reading the book for, you know, two years. Um, I can say before this interview, I did go back and I did read those uh, comics and you can tell the subtle change that happened and you go, okay, where's this coming from right <laughs> now, guys? Like <laughs> No, no I, I want to add to this. Even though I made this change to Ghost Rider, Gary Friedrich, loved what I had done with the character. We, we would meet at various conventions. We became very good friends. And, and Gary, generous guy that he is, really liked what I was doing. In fact, at one point, Gary and I, Gary and I were talking about trying to figure out who owned the rights to this Hellrider character that had been published by Skywald with the idea of reviving it somehow with, with he and I sharing the writing chores on it. So yeah, I'm a big fan of Gary Friedrich and I'm, I'm glad to say he was a fan of my work as well. So after those three years at uh, Marvel, you decide to move on and start freelancing. I'm not sure if it's a, a, a mutual departure or if there was some other undertones there, but you decide to go freelance. And what was the main reason behind going freelance? Was it because of money or was there underlying issues? If you don't know. No, um, after Roy Thomas stepped down as editor in chief, um, even though his replacements were good friends of mine, there was a lot of tension between myself and the new guys running Marvel. Um, I think they saw me more as a rival than an asset. Um, and I just thought it would be easier to work for Marvel if I 
moved back to Cleveland and wrote from Cleveland where I wouldn't be in the office. I wouldn't be, a, you know, couldn't possibly be a threat to them. That didn't work out either because, and this is not Len and Marv, but this is some of the other people in the Marvel offices. You know, they looked upon the writers and writers who were not in New York as somehow being their enemies. Uh, Jerry Conway tells a story that I never knew about that even after he had fired me off all my books uh, and, and for reasons that we needn't go into, but basically Jerry couldn't fire other people and needed more work for people who had contracts. Uh, Jerry tried to put me on another book and there was like an, a minor office uprising because they felt the book should go to somebody who worked in the office. Um, but by that time I would, I had moved over to DC, which, you know, was about as far from paradise as you could imagine. But again, you know, I, I don't want to come off as the guy who's always bitching about DC comics. Uh, but, but DC comics made you, and I, I don't want to use this word. Uh, I don't use this word lightly, but it started your uh, sort of career into creating a, a one of the biggest black superheroes in the world at the time. It, it is it like you, I know you might have some issues with DC, but DC gave you that break, right? Well, let's let's put it this way: I saved DC's ass when I created Black Lightning. <laughs> Their plan, and they had two scripts written for this character, was to publish a book called The Black Bomber, which was essentially about a white racist who took part in camouflage experiments in Vietnam so he could blend into the jungle better. Didn't show any effects in Vietnam, but when he comes home uh, at various times, uh, and I couldn't figure out the pattern from the two scripts that were written, uh, he turns into a black superhero. He didn't know he turned into a black superhero. The black superhero didn't know that he was actually a white racist. Their girlfriends witnessed the transformations and never said anything. You know, maybe it's me. I would have asked a question if I were those significant others. Um, in both of the two scripts, as the white racist, he saved somebody's life, only to discover that he saved a black person's life. And he gets all upset about this. In fact, in one case, when he saved a baby in a baby carriage, discovers it's a black child, he literally says in the scripts, in the script, you mean I risked my life for a jungle bunny. And to put the cherry on top of this shit Sunday, his costume was basically a basketball uniform. It took me two weeks to convince DC that, you know, they said, well, we want you to punch up these two scripts and take over the book with issue three. And I read them and I said, you cannot publish this book. And they go, why not? We bought the scripts. Oh no, these are the most offensive scripts I've ever read. If you publish these scripts, people will come to your offices with pitchforks and torches. And they go, how could you know that? I will be leading them. Well, and and it was in the 70s, like the, sort of the height of the civil rights movement. I know in, civil rights in all had... fairness, In all fairness to the two creators who created this character, they were doing their take on the Watermelon Man, the, the Godfrey Cambridge movie, which is a fine movie. Uh, what they didn't, they were too close to, to realize how offensive what they had created was. Um, I was given a couple of weeks to create a brand new superhero I didn't take a thing from the Black Bomber, uh, nothing from the Black Bomber. I created Jefferson Pierce first, got to know him really well, created his world. Um, I made him an Olympic athlete because that would give him the skills he needed to fight crime. At that point, he didn't have superpowers. He, um, he never made any money from the Olympics. I never got around to using this in a story. But if you remember the Olympics where a couple of black athletes gave the black power salute, well, in the DC universe, he was one of them. And as a result, you know, was pretty much didn't get any lucrative deals to promote products or anything like that. He was pretty much banished from, you know, the big money in sports. Um, but yeah, and then 
uh, about an hour and a half before I was supposed to pitch this new character to Joe Orlando and um, Sal Harrison, I realized I'd never given him a superhero name or powers. So I'm wandering around the DC offices and I see a sketch for a Wonder Woman cover in which Wonder Woman is lassoing a black lightning bolt and saying something like, Hera, help me stop this black lightning from destroying the city. It was the 70s and you know nobody would look askew, askew at a character named Black Lightning. And I said, yeah, Black Lightning, that's catchy. I'll name him Black Lightning and we'll give him some sort of electrical powers. Uh, so basically the Black Lightning part of Black Lightning was created an hour before I pitched the character. Wow. Um, <laughs> mind blowing. Um, writing a character like Black Lightning, like Jeffrey Pierce, did you expect some backlash when publishing it? Because this was the first uh, black superhero in DC Comics. Well, he wasn't the first, but he was first to headline his own comic. I apologize. Um, yes. Yeah, there were a few other, you know, more minor characters. Although one, John Stewart, ended up becoming a major character. Um, you know, I I wasn't really thinking about uh, any backlash because I should explain my background, why I wanted to work on characters of color. I grew up in Cleveland, which was a very segregated city. I had a comic book club. Uh, it was at the Cadell Recreation Center, which you know, in, late, in much later years was where Tamir Rice was murdered by police officers. Um, and I, my first black friends were comic book fans, Leroy, uh, Bruce, uh, and, and um, blanking on the name, which I shouldn't because he's interviewed me for his PBS show. Um, and they came from the east side of Cleveland to the west side of Cleveland to attend these, these meetings. And we, you know, it wasn't anything we ever talked about, but I, I just thought it was unfair that my black friends didn't have more heroes that looked like them. And so I always told myself if I was lucky enough to get into comics, I would try to work on and create characters of color. You know, at Marvel, I worked on Luke Cage. I created Misty Knight. Um, I turned Bill Foster into Black Goliath. Didn't want to call him Black Goliath, but they wouldn't let me call him Giant Man because Giant Man had apparently sold really badly. Um, so, I mean, I'd worked on him. And then at DC, I got the chance to uh, create a Black character from scratch. And it is a character that over the 40-some years has meant so much to so many people. Uh, uh, several years back at the East Coast Black Age of Comics convention, a woman who has since become a very dear friend came up to me and hugged me with tears in her eyes because Black Lightning was the first time she had seen herself in a comic book. Um, Sinbad, the comedian, is a big Black Lightning fan. Um, and we've talked several times. I was a guest of his at one of his uh, shows in the Cleveland area. Uh, over and over again, I've, I've met teachers who became teachers because of Jefferson Pierce uh, and comics creators, uh, black comics creators who were inspired by Black Lightning to, to get into comics and do their own thing. Um, to this day, you know, if Black Lightning ends up being my legacy, which it probably will, since I'm not working much these days, or at all, um, it's a pretty damn good legacy. Um, the TV show is brilliant. From the start, everybody on the TV show has given me such love and respect. Um, I had conference calls with Salim and Mara Brock Akeel when they were just hired to be the showrunners of this show. Um, Salim flew me out before the show started to spend a day with the writers. Uh, I walked into the writer's room. On one side of the wall is a whiteboard where they blocked out um, the 13 episodes of the first season. And here, here's, a, here's a news flash for you. Neither Peter Gamby nor Tobias Whale were supposed to survive the first season. Wow. My own, my own theory is that once they got James Remar and my dear friend Croydon to play those roles, 
they just weren't about to lose them. On the other side of the room was a, a wall of character names and pictures. And I suddenly looking at both these walls, I go, well, that's mine. That's fine. I did that. I created that character. There was so much of me in the show from the start. And then they developed it, you know, in marvelous ways, taking it further in many areas that I could have. Uh, but the very first episode, one of the first, the first voiceover, I think, is justice like lightning should ever appear to some men hope and to other men fear, which was my, you know, rewriting an old poem to convey what I wanted to convey. Um, and I've been on the set where I, you know, if I go on the set, 40 people will come up to me thanking me for their jobs. I've corresponded with a lot of the actors and writers and like right down the line, uh, the love and respect I get from, I got from that cast and crew. Um, I even did a cameo at the end of the third season, Trevor Von Eden and I were judges. Um, I was, was that a good experience for yourself to be on oh, the yeah, show? It, it was, um, even though one of my lines got cut because I was being too, my first line was too complimentary towards Black Lightning. And, and, and I think, you know, the idea of this white federal judge being that complimentary might have seemed at odds with them. But there were three judges, uh, Trevor, myself, actress uh, Jennifer Krista Palmer. She was the best, but of course she was professional. Trevor was really good although he had to repeat lines because he got them wrong sometimes. I got all my lines right, but Trevor was a better actor. Um, and I have uh, a question about the name Black Lightning. You talked about the uh, history of how it came about. In, I'm not sure if you've seen uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, the new Marvel yeah, Disney yeah. Plus series. There's a line in there where a child is talking to the Falcon and he says, hey, are you Black Falcon? And he says, no, I'm just the Falcon and I just happen to be Black. If you were to write Black Lightning, Lightning today, would you call still call him Black Lightning? Yes. Or would you have just because, called him Lightning? Because to Jefferson Pierce, Black Lightning is part of who he is. He is proud of being Black. He, he recognizes that he is a role model to, to, to black people. So yes, but you know, I mean, I, I actually, in my second Black Lightning series um, in, in the 90s, I actually poked a little bit fun of that because he's showing his ex-wife around his, his headquarters, which is basically the basement of a, of a building he owns. And, and she makes a joke about, you know, he's talking about a black man, uh, how Batman, sent him you know a design for a, a black lightning car <laughs> he's just sitting gathering dust on a thing and and his wife lynn makes a joke about what is this the black cave <laughs> so yeah i'm aware i'm aware of yeah black lightning you know we can tell he's black uh, although you can't tell he's black now because he's a living lightning bolt yeah uh, but you know it's 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 who he is. It's who he is. And I'll defend that name till the day I die. Uh, to be honest with you, there's nothing I would rather do than write Black Lightning stories until the day I die. Um, that does not seem likely. Um, DC Comics kind of kicked me to the curb after Cold Dead Hands, which I suspect they only gave me because they thought I was you know, I would be, you know, bitter and publicly bitter about the TV series, which is crazy thinking. But again, you know, I'm not going to say that that people at DC aren't too clueless sometimes, because here's a beautiful show based on my work. My name is in the opening credits. I've always been treated with respect by the cast and crew. I've been I visited the set several times. I was at one of the rap parties uh you know were you disappointed when it got didn't get renewed for another season yeah i'm very disappointed i don't know all the details i know you know i was told once that some of the actors did not want to come back uh i knew china and mclean wanted to leave uh and they did you know they have recast that role they did recast that role in what i thought was brilliant fashion but I guess they felt they couldn't recast too many of the roles. Uh, I'm hoping Painkiller, the Painkiller pilot gets picked up because, uh, you know, that would allow at least some of these characters to appear 
Um, I have created my own spinoff, which uh, I plan to show to Salim Akio, uh, but it's the kind of spinoff that uh, if it doesn't, you know, if Salim doesn't go for it, I can take out the black lightning elements and do it separately. It, it would be if, if we were to do this spinoff that I created, it would be the most different TV superhero series you have ever seen. I'm, I'm amazed that nobody's done this before. The, the DC television universe has been one of the most successful entities of DC on film ever. Looking back at the 19, in the 1977 when Black Lightning, the first comic book series came out, could you have imagined that a TV series that's lasted four seasons would have ever been made by a character that you would have created? I thought Black Lightning could be a TV series from the moment I pitched the character. Really? I even said it could be the adventures of Superman for the 1970s. Uh, unfortunately, DC, for whatever reason, was never really interested in pushing it. Um, the whole time before Jeff Johns got behind the, doing a series, uh, the whole time the, there was one option to Black Lightning sold to Lorimar, uh, which was a Warner company. So my cut of, of the uh, money you know, from that option was pathetic, uh, even for that day and age. Uh, Hanna-Barbera had planned to use Black Lightning and Super Friends. Uh, DC didn't want to give me part of their money, uh, which was the deal. So they told Hanna Barbera that they'd have to pay extra to use Black Lightning, and Hanna Barbera declined and did their own kind of cheap version of uh, Black Lightning. Um, over the years, I know that Static Shock had wanted to guest star Black Lightning. Uh, DC initially asked them for more money than it would have cost to have, than it cost the show to have Batman in it. And when the show said they'd pay it, DC said, no, we don't want you to, to use Black Lightning. Black Lightning wasn't allowed to be in, in Justice League Unlimited. Uh, again, it wasn't until some of the animated projects uh, that came along later, but it was especially Jeff Johns, who, who is a fan of my work, is a fan of Black Lightning. Jeff Johns was the one who called me up uh, arranged for DC and I to work out an agreement, not a perfect agreement, but much better than what had been down there previously. And it was Jeff Johns, Jeff, Jeff Johns uh, backing of this series that got it made. After the, I would say, second reincarnation of Black Lightning in the 90s, you go on to continue freelancing, might not as be as much as in-depth as you were back in the 70s, but you are freelancing. Uh, to now, uh, I've got to ask the question, how is the comic book industry to people like yourself who have, who, who and I, I don't want to use this lightly, who were there at in the beginning of it, like in the 70s and the 60s, who actually made these, who developed these characters who have... Uh, spawned so much love and admiration around the world for generations to come. How has the comic book industry uh, uh, treated writers and editors like yourself? I know we've talked about it a little yeah. bit, but I want to talk okay. about it because you do talk about it a lot and I want to dive into it a little bit. Okay, well, first off, living creators are really inconvenient to com comic book publishers and editors. Uh, because it means somebody knows the characters better than they do. And, and that's a threat to them on some level. Um, I think, you know, some of them just decide, well, you're too old. I'm, I'm 69 years old. Uh, I'm told I look much younger. I figure people are just being nice. Uh, I'm as good now as I ever was. And in fact, every time I wrote Black Lightning, I upped my game. My 90s series is better written than my 70s series, and Cold Dead Hands is possibly the best thing I've ever written. Uh, the, the detail and background and, and, and social events and characterization that went into Cold Dead Hands 
is even better than my 90 series, which some people tell me is still their favorite. Um, I can't, I, it hurts my head when I try to, to look at these companies and, and wonder why they're not interested in working with me. I've got a pretty good track record. I've done good stories. Most of them hold up decades after I wrote them. Uh, hardly a month goes by then I don't hear from some writer or a TV person or movie person telling me that my work inspired them. I mean, if you told me that John Ridley, you know, this, you know, Oscar winning screenwriter credits me with his interest in writing, you know, that's, that's not something I would have expected, but I've come to realize that there's a lot of people over the decades that my work has meant a lot to, um, I can still do that work. I can still come up with new characters and concepts. What I can't figure out is how to break through whatever misconceptions, you know, editors at Marvel and DC might have about me. So uh, is it just that, you or is it other oh, creators like yourself who, who were you know, there? I don't, I, I can't, I'm not going to try to speak for other creators, but yeah, I mean, you know, I know of an artist who's one of the most brilliant artists around whose drawing is amazing. And he barely works in comics these days. Look at look at the great artists who basically make their living these days doing commissions instead of writing and drawing comics. Part of that is economics. Uh, DC and Marvel can get talent from uh, Italy and Brazil and other countries cheaper than the American talent. Um, Part of that is because Marvel and DC got into all these bidding wars for writers and artists and elevated the, the rates to, to a tremendous level. My rate actually at DC is, is really modest compared to, to what they were paying their, their so-called top writers, the, the writers that they, they basically bid on. Um, and I'm flexible on stuff like that. 